Peter Capaldi looks so cool with those fucking sunglasses. Welcome to E3, a week-long media cavalcade filled to the brim with shock, surprise, mediocrity and a shit ton of fanboy disappointment. Ever since its inception all the way back in 1995, the Electronic Entertainment Expo has been the ultimate gathering for gamers to gawp at the flashiest, latest announcements from the industry's biggest and greediest corporate conglomerates. From the friendly folks at Nintendo to the forward-thinking, determined lads at Sony. It's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! Remember that one? An E3 conference is normally divided into several categories. You have an annoying, normally pretentious host, more clarity on previously announced games, awkward continuity to liven up the anxiety of being on stage in front of millions of viewers, and big, massive trailers for brand new games that will eventually be released two years later, and then another two years later, be unknowingly sold at charity shops for 93% off its original price tag. Hmm, how depressing. For this year as a change, I didn't get myself overly excited at the announcements, so for every show that I did see, I came in with a positive mindset and not played by any negative, potentially pessimistic thoughts like, oh this game is bloody terrible, or wow, this is so awful. You see what I mean? Shall we start talking about the E3 show? Yeah, I think we should. We start off with EA, the largest third party developer in the industry and um, it was bad, I guess. This year, human android Andrew Wilson brought along 6 new maps for Battlefield 1 which I didn't really care, NBA Live and John Madden 18, interesting new IPs with a way out from the creators of Brothers of Tale of Two Sons and Anthem from Bioware and Cristiano Ronaldo blesses FIFA 18 with his likeness for player data and… hang on, who the hell are the men in blazers? You know what? You can start a religion with this. Actually, please don't. Alex Hunter was the big talking point with these dicks in suits, as successful story mode The Journey is set to return in FIFA 18. The Journey, Hunter Returns? <sighs> this is beginning to sound like a movie franchise. The Journey, The Phantom Menace, anyone? Having played the original with Alex playing for Tottenham Hotspur and then joining Norwich City, I'm glad to see that this mode will be back and this time, Hunter, now a successful top flight footballer, faces the pressure of other clubs trying to sign him for huge sums of cash, like Real Madrid. Similar to the first edition of the journey, this will be powered by the amazing Frostbite engine with the promise of real FIFA worlds. What? As in, an organisation formerly ran by politically corrupt crooks like Sepp Blatter, Jack Warner, Santa Claus, oh I'm sorry, Chuck Blazer? One game discussed in EA's presentation was Need for Speed Payback, with a preview featuring a high speed chase against the police. Now, I'm a sucker for this series, having played Need for Speed Underground 1, 2 and Most Wanted on the PS2 back in the day, so I might be willing to give this game a try, especially if it sees a release on the Nintendo Switch. Riders on the storm. EA's presentation was nothing significant and he didn't miss out on anything important if you missed watching it live. If anything, the biggest disappointment of the show was the lack of even more titles being announced, like Fidget Spinning 18 and cracking open a cold one with the boys 2018 courtesy of EA Sports. And while it was a bit overkill devoting half an hour to Star Wars Battlefront 2, it looks top notch and the developers from DICE have listened to the feedback from the first Battlefront, including one tweet from John Boyega who plays Finn in the main films. Plus, I remember playing a public demo of the first game before its launch, but I sucked at playing it. Hashtag I suck at gaming. Microsoft thankfully upped the ante this year with their Xbox One, and most importantly, the Xbox One X. Seriously? Is that the name you're gonna use? You might as well call it the Xbox One XXX Temptation while you're at it. The console sports a slim design, similar to the One S, and does not replicate the aesthetic of that old VCR hiding inside your house's loft, much like the first Xbox One. The new console is priced at $500, and its biggest selling point is that it can output graphics at native 4K Ultra HD, making games look more glamorous and outstanding thanks to a system on the chip named the Scorpio Engine, boasting a whopping 6 teraflops of graphical computing power. But of course, the most important element of any console is its library of games. 
and there were 42 Xbox games playable at the event, with enhancements when played on the One X, such as Forza Motorsport 7, The Forza Awakens, Metro Exodus Train Jumping Simulator, Assassin's Creed Origins, Ori and the Blind Forest 2, and Minecraft, where a 4K update was announced and gamers from all platforms can cross-play with each other, whether you're playing on Windows 10 or Nintendo Switch, but if you have a PS4, never mind that. Also, a range of original Xbox games can now be played on the Xbox One, coupled with a replica of the infamous Duke controller, and on the subject of 4K, there are many currently existing Xbox and games that will be getting updates, including Final Fantasy XV, Forza Horizon 3, and my personal favourite, Rocket League. Microsoft's show was far better than EA's, and many of the games that were shown look great. From Dragon Ball Fighter Z appealing to the anime Fast Cat, Cuphead with its 1930s cartoon art style finally releasing on September 29th, to The Last Night fueled by beautiful aesthetics. Super Lucky's tale on the other hand is feeling like Conker's bad fur day on the N64, minus the expertise and cause content, but the main character looks suspiciously like Tails from the Sonic the Hedgehog series. The preview to Sea of Thieves from Rare was wicked, and Life is Strange Before the Storm looks awesome, yet I've not played the first one, which I really should get around to sorting out because apparently it's a superb title that's worth playing. Following up came Lomba Bethesda, fresh from a monumentous year with a re-release of The Elder Scrolls Skyrim, to whom will receive a release on the Nintendo Switch and allow players to dress up as Link as well as support for Amiibo and motion controls. Other games featured were two VR games coming to the HTC Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe, one of which being Doom VFR and Fallout 4 VR which was announced last year. Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus is now theme continuing the story of a Nazi occupied world, The Creepy Evil Within 2 is scheduled for release on Friday the 13th of October 2017 and the Elder Scrolls card game is getting an add-on under the guise of Heroes of Skyrim. Yay! My favourite! For legal reasons, I have to disclose that the insider will be played by an actor with an altered voice. Hello, so you're a gaming journalist who had access to travel to Los Angeles to attend the 2017 E3 Expo, am I right? Yeah. So, that meant you got to play all the upcoming games in advance of the general public who can't wait to give them a shot? Yeah, absolutely. Fuck you. Okay, so perhaps you could tell me the average process that the idea of a new game console goes through before it gets officially unveiled at E3? Well, video games are a rapidly expanding industry and you must be on the lookout for any technological changes that occur. Six years ago, 3D gaming was set to be the feature with the 3DS, films, TVs and 3D smartphones all hitting the market. But nobody actually gave a shit because of all the media's fear pounding stories, like how the 3DS will give you headaches like the pussy you are, or how 3D movies are a gimmick that adds nothing significant at all to the final product, like the pussy you are, and how you're essentially spending £3 more than tickets so that you can wear a pair of silly glasses as you sit through another shit state like Cars 2, and cry deep inside and lament a past to be loved but now I'm loved, as fucking Cassandra left me for great in that fucking theatre in front of everyone. And the pussy... I am. Nowadays, everybody's rambling about virtual reality and how the Oculus Rift and PlayStation VR is clapped or on fleek, whatever new buzzword the English language shut out this week basically, and how it's become a key element in the design of our next system and contents of our titles. However, when discussing this idea to our brain box staff members, it always devolves into a pissing contest over which new idea is more suitable, virtual reality or 4K. Do you want more gorgeous visuals or a headset that makes you look like a bloody bellend in public and to your friends? Mm hmm, interesting. Also, what about the creation of games? What sort of rigorous testing goes through to find that perfect experience that everybody can enjoy? Well, in reality, we just spend all day on the internet looking up the newest trends or memes as our sophisticated millennial generation will refer to, and these ideas are tested out on every cultural background of gamers that you can imagine. For instance, we planned the HD remake of Crawling in the House for all current gen consoles, and while the American demographic absolutely loved the shit I've seen the National Hero in glorious 10 HP 60 frames per second, strutting his swag across the White House, the British audience on the other hand were less than delighted. They thought that Corey Baxter was a pretentious wanker with his unusual fetish for lemon drizzle cakes. Instead, they wanted Ed Sheeran being publicly executed for his crimes against humanity with the Queen watching in the background. Hmm. Strutting this swagger across the White House. For some reason, that vaguely reminds me of Bill Clinton. Also, if the sausage roll is considered the best food in the UK, what are your options if you're a vegan who can't eat meat instead? 
Well, there's always the Freddy boss, but it's pretty tough to recommend him now, since they used to be insanely cheap at 10p, before shooting up in prices as high as 65p. Inflation has hit the bloody roof, I tell you what, just like your mum. Hello? Where are you? What? Where are you? Mum, what are you doing here? I'm in the middle of a really important interview. <sighs> bloody hell. Moving on to Ubisoft, the best thing to come up from France and Daft Punk, Christine and the Queens, and the almighty Tuna Baguette. They got off to a great start with the official unveiling of Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom on the Switch, bringing out the goat himself that Shigeru Miyamoto out on stage with Bill Trinan from Nintendo of America. Being created by developers in Paris, the game has been described as a tactical adventure where the rabbits have teamed up with Mario, Luigi, Yoshi and Princess Peach, a bit like an adorable version of XCOM but with Mario and the rabbits though sadly no Rayman. What a shame. To me, the best part of this exciting collaboration is that it accurately portrays the reality of Tinder dates. At first, she looks gorgeous from her profile pictures but when you swipe right and meet her in real life, you realise that, you know, something's pretty odd. Not that I've ever been on a Tinder date myself. The other games shown included The Crew 2, Far Cry 5 set in dystopian America, two South Park games with the Mobile Destroyer and the Fractured Butt Hole, and a cringeworthy demonstration of Just Dance 2018, featuring pop star BB Rexa and an inexplicable Jamiroquai cameo. And if you thought Sea of Thieves from the Microsoft conference was great, just wait until you see Skulls and Bones by Ubisoft. Another swashbuckling pirate adventure, which is more realistic and authentic than compared to the more laid back residuals of rare Sea of Thieves. But lastly, Ubisoft saved the best for the last by finishing off a stunning show with a sequel to the criminally underrated Beyond Good and Evil. Set in a universe where animals and human scenes coexist, including this one pig who I assume was sexually assaulted by former British Prime Minister David Cameron as a youngster. What? Do you not remember Piggate? That story put me off from eating sausages for nearly a year. Next, we head over to Sony, who last year released a PS4 Slim, Pro and the PSVR, which I've yet to purchase because of its expensive price tag. To begin the show, the company brought out an ensemble group of musicians to accompany the trailer for Uncharted The Lost Legacy, a spin-off to the main series that won't star Nathan Drake. What followed were games galore from Days Gone, Monster Hunter World, a Shadow of the Colossus remaster on the PS4, Marvel vs Capcom Infinite starring the Avengers and Rocket Raccoon of Guardians of the Galaxy, Call of Duty World War 2, if that's what you're interested in, and Skyrim VR. This announcement leads well to the fact that the critically acclaimed title will soon be available on iOS devices, as announced in the Bethesda conference a few hours before Sony's. Before you know it, Skyrim will be available on just about anything, a washing machine, a Game Boy, a Sinclair ZX Spectrum, and a roll of toilet paper just to name a few. The PlayStation VR accessory has been blessed with more games to take advantage of its capabilities in addition to Skyrim VR, like Bravo Team, Star Child, The Adventures of a Mouse in Moss, no, not Moss from the IT crowd, and The Impatient, a psychological thriller where you play as a patient diagnosed with amnesia from a first person perspective. Towards the second half of the show, a new God of War was revealed, set for an early 2018 release, alongside the exciting neo-noir adventure in Detroit Becomes Human revolving around androids rebelling against their human masters, and lastly, an exclusive to look forward to in Marvel's Spider-Man. Marvelous! All we need now is the pizza theme from Spider-Man 2 and we're all set for what could be Game of the Year material. <laughs> That's a idea. Finally, after everybody else, came along Nintendo, who promised a mere 30 minute presentation, similar in vain to their common Nintendo Direct broadcasts, and it was actually amazing, seriously. The show got off to a fantastic start with one of my most wanted games on the Switch finally becoming a reality, Rocket League. I've already reviewed this game on the PS4, but if you haven't played it, it's one of the most entertaining games that I've played in recent memory. After that, Lord Reggie Fizeme brought out the big guns with Xenoblade Chronicles 2, a perfect match for the Switch as it's an engrossing RPG that can be played anywhere you go. Next up came that pink puffball bastard who is Kirby, who will have a new game in 2017, a Pokemon RPG is in the works for the Switch but don't expect it to come out anytime soon. And holy shit, Metroid Prime 4 and, and Metroid Samus Returns, yeah!
Meanwhile, Yoshi has been gifted with a cute new game and there is more clarity on Breath of the Wild's upcoming DLC packs, including one master mode for the seasoned gamers. However, despite all these titles, the biggest highlight of this concise presentation was of course, Super Mario Odyssey, and oh my god does this look brilliant. Not only is Mario a dinosaur, a chain chomp, and a stereotypical Mexican thanks to his genius hat, but he is also a human being possessing their bodies, a bullet bill, a Goomba effectively putting the lonely Goomba out of a job, and a freaking taxi. It's a me, your Uber driver! Scoot! The game takes place in numerous kingdoms including the Metro Kingdom, which is home to New Donk City. This fascinating world is inspired by real cities like New York City, and Pauline from the original Donkey Kong is the mayor of the city, which is absolutely mind-blowing. Furthermore, instead of the cliched story of Princess Peach getting kidnapped by Bowser for the 18th millionth time, Mario must prevent a forced match between Bowser and Peach from happening. And best of all, the evil wedding planning firm in the game is called Brudel. Get it? Bridal? Brutal? Fucking genius! In conclusion, E3 2017 was a thrilling spectacle, a celebration of the colourful video game industry, and gamers everywhere including me were left with a satisfying outlook for the titles that we'll all be playing soon in the future. The best show by far was Nintendo's, but at the end of the day, there is no company who won E3 as some people might want you to think. No, that would be the fans, for their constant dedication to the games that they enjoy and buy with their hard earned money. Unless you're like me, who relies on the bank of their parents for new titles. Honourable mentions go out to Intel, Devolver Digital and PC Gamer who hosted their own press conferences but I didn't have enough time to cover them in detail. That said, Devolver Digital's show was an amusing affair that took the piss out of the industry as well as your stereotypical E3 show. With Devolver Com and created content, it is you, the player, who is in control and it is available now already on every major forum, message board and live chat. Give it up, everybody! And now, this video has come to a close. If you enjoyed it, go give it a like, comment and subscribe to my channel for more content in the future. Now if you excuse me, I'm going to watch some Shiba Inu videos with the intro to this charming man by the Smiths playing in the background. Goodbye. Oh, isn't that cute little puppy? Oh, so cute. Oh, super cute.